The way the calendar has worked this year has been quite providential in many ways. And for example, today, the anniversary of my start date at St. Jude gets to fall on a Sunday, and so I get to comment on it on the day. Instead of giving my normal review of the parish that I would do, I just want to offer the following very simple commentary. I am extremely happy at St. Jude's. These have been great years, at least for me. And not having come to know many of you would be a sad loss to me. Normally, I would take this opportunity to comment on the people that might not be happy with me being here, at least not as happy as I am. But the Lord has done some great healing in me this last year, and I don't actually feel nearly as compelled to say anything about that. But if someone needs to see me because there is an offense that's being held against me, please, as our Lord tells us we must do, talk to me. And yes, please continue stepping up to volunteer for this Mass well. Today is the feast day of St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face, the little flower most commonly known as Therese of Lisieux. She is one of the universal doctors of the church and is particularly known for her little way, that is, finding holiness in the little moments of everyday life. But she's also known for her powerful intercession. In fact, it is said that when you ask a favor of her, if it is granted, you will receive in some form a rose. And while I have very few supernatural occurrences in my life that I'm aware of, I actually can attest to this one. I will try to keep myself together to tell the story. When I was a seminarian, I was assigned to Our Lady of Victory in Paris. And I received word one day that Ryan Enomos had been killed in a car crash. Uh, he was the younger brother of a, my closest friend at the time and one of my mentorees. And needless to say, I was extremely upset. And so I did something that I don't normally do because I knew that he had been struggling with serious sin. I asked Therese, I said, look, I don't normally do this, but I really need a sign, okay, if he's okay. So the day before that Ryan died, Nancy Love had died. She was actually from the parish. She is uh, formerly the wife of now father, Larry Love, who is a priest of the diocese. I was serving Nancy's funeral a day or two later when, as they were, so I'm a seminarian at this point, I'm standing there with the crucifix at the hearse, and as they load the cask, Nancy's casket into the hearse, a single rose fell off the flower arrangement at my feet. You can't get any more clear than that. So needless to say, I was very moved by that. I took the rose down to San Antonio for Ryan's funeral, and I gave it to his mother. Uh, needless to say, she appreciated it even more than I did. Now, I do want to add a caveat to this story, please. It is not healthy to constantly be asking God for signs, and I certainly do not recommend doing so for all of your beloved dead, if nothing else, to avoid the disappointment. I have done it in other instances and have not received a rose, and I believe it's because Ryan's mother really needed that gift. I certainly appreciate it as well. So, the point being, I thought it was, uh, I certainly know of Therese's uh, interest in us and her intercession, and so definitely commend her to you. We celebrate all of the Holy Guardian Angels on October 2nd, as I mentioned last, in last week's sermon, and the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi is on the 4th. St. Francis is one of the greatest men who ever lived despite the fact that he has been turned into a farce by modernists and looks more, in, in most art, like a Disney princess than a real man. By that I mean an effeminate pose surrounded by little animals like Snow White. He was a great man who knew how to mortify himself and had more virtue than most men are capable of. He embraced an extreme form of poverty, uh, out of love for God, out of love for God, 
he practiced great mortifications and spent most of his time in prayer. And because his love of God was so strong that he was gifted the stigmata that is experiencing the wounds of Christ in his hands, his feet, and side, which he is often not depicted with in modern art. St. Francis also had no shame in confronting evil, firstly in himself and then in others. He did severe penance, dying to himself in every way possible. He renounced his very wealthy family life to follow God. And three times he sought martyrdom, none of which God in his providence permitted his death. But one of them is fairly dramatic that I want to share as a story. During the Sixth Crusade, he went to Palestine and confronted the Mohammedan Sultan, declaring, I am sent not by men, but by the Most High God, to show you and your people the way to salvation by announcing to you the truth of the Gospel. St. Francis challenged the Sultan to build a very large fire, and he said that he and his Imams, their prayer leaders or whatever, to walk into that fire to show who would be, who is the real God, what is the true religion. The Sultan responded that none of his Imams would be willing to make that kind of a sacrifice for their religion. So that, that, that test did not happen. The Sultan heard him, but eventually sent him away for fear of sedition in his army because of how eloquently and fervently St. Francis preached Jesus Christ. We would all do well to repeat the words that St. Francis often repeated to his brothers. Let us begin to serve the Lord our God, for hitherto we have made very little progress. The 5th of October is the feast of St. Faustina Kowalska, who is the mystic to whom our Lord gave the modern devotion, the modern form of the devotion to the Divine Mercy. And we celebrate the Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the 7th, a feast day which used to be called Our Lady of Victory because of the reason for the feast day, as we read in the Martyrology. The memorial of St. Mary's style of victory, the yearly observance of which memorial the Supreme Pontiff, Blessed Pius V, ordained on account of the famous victory gained by the Christians over the Turks upon this day in the sea fight of Lepanto by the help of the aforesaid Mother of God. In his sickness, Saint Francis, someone proposed to St. Francis that they might read a book to him in order to make him feel better. He responded, nothing gives me so much delight as to think on the life and passion of our Lord. I continually employ my mind on this object, and were I to live to the end of the world, I should stand in need of no other books. St. Francis, second to the Passion of Our Lord, also had a very great devotion to our Lord's infancy. Both of these be major elements of the mysteries of the life of our Lord and key meditations in the Holy Rosary, in light of which feast I'd like to make a few comments this Sunday. We've already spoken at length even recently about uh, the importance and even necessity of devotion to our Blessed Mother. No Christian can claim God as a father and Jesus Christ as our brother and at the same time deny the motherhood of Mary. She was no more just a vessel, as many claim, than your own mothers were just vessels. I can just imagine some Protestant walking up to their mother and saying, well, you were just a vessel. See how, long, how far that gets them. Of all devotions to Our Lady, however, the greatest of those is the Holy Rosary. If nothing else, because she herself keeps recommending it to us and asking us to pray it. The saints, of course, also give their endorsement of this great prayer. St. Maximilian Colby, who we spoke about recently, said, The Rosary is a very sublime prayer because by reciting it, we reflect upon the mysteries of faith, Moreover, the more one is keen and competent in matters of faith, the deeper one can reflect on these mysteries and be led to discover in them an ever-growing number of practical tips for life. Pope Leo XIII, who wrote more about Our Lady and Her Rosary than any other pope, I suspect, said, It is mainly to expand the kingdom of Christ that we look to the Rosary for the most effective help. 
Padre Pio said, Our Lady has never refused me a grace through the recitation of the rosary for many, many, many other saints. It's not necessary here and now to go over how, in detail, how to pray the rosary. So I will not do that, but there are two things that I want to recommend uh, as a reminder. The first is that the heart of the rosary is the meditation on the mystery of our Lord's life, death, and resurrection. Obviously, with the praying of the Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, etc. We want to make sure that we do not lose that in all of the other prayers that we do. There are some prayers that are customarily done at the end of each decade and at the beginning and end of the rosary, but we want to remember that the heart of the rosary is the meditation with the Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be. And so especially when we're praying it communally, that we keep it as simple as necessary. The other thing, I'm oh, sorry, and to pause after, or at the beginning of each mystery, to actually reflect on the mystery before we begin the Our Father. It's difficult to do, depending on how organized we are, but we want to make sure that we give that good pause and don't just immediately jump in as we have time to recollect on the mystery that we're meditating on. It's also important that we remember when it comes to the rosary that we, are, we pray it communally and not privately because it's modeled on the divine office that we should be prayed in good order, at the same volume, at the same rhythm, offering one voice to God using the same words. This means that we have to listen to the people around us. When praying publicly, we want to make sure that we are not louder than everybody else, but that we can be heard, and that we are not finishing the Hail Mary several words before or after everybody else. Now, obviously, most people who do that are half deaf anyway, so they may not be able to hear me saying this right now. So if you're sitting next to someone who is deaf, please let them know. But we want to make sure that we're listening and that we're praying in good order together with one voice. So again, the rosary is the greatest prayer. And by this I mean, of course, devotional prayer. The mass is also a prayer, but it's also a sacrifice and a sacrament. Therefore, I'm not talking about that because the Mass is the greatest thing we've got. There's nothing better than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But for devotional prayers, there's nothing greater than the Holy Rosary. There are many, many reasons for it. I just want to mention a few before I conclude. First of all, the Rosary as a whole contains the greatest prayers. We have a summary of the faith and the creed. We have the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. We have the angelic salutation, the Hail Mary, which includes the way that God himself addresses Our Lady, and we have the glory be praising the Most Holy Trinity. The Holy Rosary, and particularly here I'm speaking of the beads themselves, is like taking our Blessed Mother by the hand. The beads are a comfort to the anxious, to the lonely, and to the sorrowing. Carrying a Blessed Rosary is like having a pocket full of ammunition or a sword strapped to you. The Rosary is a great spiritual weapon against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the meditations of the Holy Rosary provide us with all of the spiritual food for meditation that we need. And I do mean that. I stand by that statement. Because in the Rosary, you find everything about our blessed Lord, all of his earthly life, and the mystery of our salvation. You see the church. You see Our Lady. You have all of the sacraments. Of course, you have prayer because that's what we're doing. It's all in the rosary and provides us with the virtues and examples of how to live that we find there. It's all in the rosary. It is a perfect summary of the Catholic faith in pocket form. And if you have a rosary, and I mean even just the built-in one that you have, you cannot fail to spend long periods of time immersed in prayer. There are 20 mysteries in the rosary, and you can say them all every day, even more than once. You can pray them while traveling, you can pray them while working, you can pray for them while you're waiting, or you can pray them deliberately, without an excuse, just to pass the time. The last couple of weeks, I've been committed to praying the full 20 mysteries, which I have done on most days for these last several weeks. And 
it's amazing that despite how busy that I am and how I legitimately have a very full schedule, I have been able to find the time. I would say partially because Our Lady multiplies my time, but also because you simply put aside other things that are distracting you and wasting your time. It's amazing how much time for prayer you can make if you commit to it. How much better can you spend your time when your duties permit than with Mama Mary contemplating the mysteries of the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord, which he wrought for our salvation? For the human soul, nothing is more essential than the sacraments, especially after baptism, the most blessed sacrament of the altar. But second to the sacraments is prayer, and there is nothing more holy, more profound, and more efficacious than the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. May we meditate on these mysteries daily so as to imitate what they 